Hey guys, Civil Defense Engineer here, and I'm going to be making a video on engineering for the low attention span brain rot out there. And uh, it's probably not going to be as popular as my last one, which was admittedly kind of clickbaity, but uh, I want to make meaningful content, and whether you watch it or not, that's what I'm making. Alright, so this video is on the engineering process. So I'll explain all the steps that are typically involved, and then I'll demonstrate how to apply that by showcasing my plans to design and build a long-range fixed-wing ISR drone. And uh, it's gonna be interesting. Let's see how it goes. So the first step is to define the requirements. Now in the big boy engineering world, these will likely come from the customer or the government or whoever you're working with. At the civil defense engineer YouTube level, these will be arbitrarily defined by you, or me in this case, and probably routinely modified as you work out the costs and realize maybe we can pull this back a little bit. <laughs> and that happens at the big boy engineering level too, but uh, it is really easy to happen at the one-man show level. So for example, for this drone, maybe I want it to fly 40 kilometers because that's the distance to a significant point of interest from my house. No reason. Time over target, 10 minutes. Payload, let's say one kilogram. Actually, I have my little thermal device. Maybe I will use that as the payload. That would be rather interesting and not very smart because it's kind of bulky for a thermal. I should probably get a smaller camera. I'll want it to have autonomous control with GPS waypoints. And if I'm really ambitious, maybe I'll have a jam-proof version that uses just an inertial measurement unit and barometric pressure and a camera to completely autonomously fly a mission using machine vision to pilot it, you know, kind of figure out where the horizon is and then use an IMU to figure out how how far you've traveled, that kind of thing. And then it'll need to have real-time telemetry, at least position, battery level, because we'll need to know how much flight time there you have left. And then video, of course, because if it's an ISR drone, you need to know what you're looking at. So transmitting controls 40 kilometers is hard enough. Transmitting video that far, that's probably going to be a big problem to solve. Then we'll have to define interfaces. So your product will have internal and external interfaces. The external interfaces may be defined by existing hardware that you have to work with, maybe defined by the customer, or just defined by mission requirements. And your internal interfaces, they just have to be internally consistent, you know, so everything mates up properly. And if you have outputs from one thing, it feeds into the inputs of another thing. So for these, you'll have to create ICDs, interface control documents. And this can be as simple as a pinout on an electronic board or as complex as a whole document detailing, you know, bolt patterns and any, any kind of interfaces that you can think of. And then there's TRL assessment and coming up with a development path based on how mature the design concept already is. Is this a thing that's been built and flown a gazillion times? Then it's TRL 9. Is this theoretically possible based on some sketchy physics? That's TRL 1 or maybe 0. The TRL level has a very specific defined scale in industry, but I'm going to use the concept to get you to think about how much work you need to do on an individual basis to build the technologies that you are currently lacking. So I personally lack and need to develop the ability to know some machine vision AI type coding stuff. I don't know anything about that. I'm at a I'm at a one right there. <laughs> I've done programming and stuff in the past, so I'm not too worried about that, but I need to work on those skills. I've built RC planes before from scratch, but I've never had a flight computer on it that is flying itself using sensor input. 
So I need to learn all those things. But they've been done before, so that automatically moves it up the TRL level, because I can just look it up online or ask ChatGPT. <laughs> no, I, I want to actually learn it for myself. You may also want to break your project into bite-sized chunks at this level that focus on one key area that you need to develop. So I've identified four basic baby steps here. Just build a easy flyer to get yourself back into RC because it's been at least 10 years since I've built an RC plane. I don't even have the components anymore. I need to get a radio, for example. Then I'll put a flight computer on this easy flyer and try and do some autonomous waypoint navigation. And then I will build the full scale version, which will be able to hold that one kilogram payload and fly the full long distance. And for that, I will also need to develop long range telemetry. So at this point, we're still very high level. We just have the basic concept of what we want to build. And at this point, I'll need to get a budget. I'll need to go before Congress, AKA my wife, and submit a budget request. And it would help if I had a preliminary bill of materials to kind of back up what I'm requesting. That will help me with the cost and labor estimate. If you're getting money from somewhere else, you'll definitely be required to provide some evidence to show that your estimate has some realism here. So that would be called a basis of estimate. And it's used for when you're submitting proposals for projects. But if you're just a one-man show, all you need to do is convince yourself that it's feasible, and there you go. Next, you'll have to track the size, weight, and power of your product, especially if it's an aerospace vehicle or anything that needs performance. You know, things that are carried are something you might want to track your size and weight on as well. But in aerospace especially, weight and power have major impact on the performance of your vehicle. So come up with a mass budget, assign a mass growth allowance because your initial assessment is going to be off. And the further you progress through the design stages, that, that mass growth allowance will shrink more and more and more as it gets more defined. And same thing with power. If you have electrical systems on board, it's a good idea to do a power budget because you'll need that when evaluating flight time and other like range requirements later. Then we have design and analysis cycles. This is the meat and potatoes of the engineering process because it's an iterative process. Your first design is not going to cut it in the end because you're going to come up with reasons why it's not going to work right away, right off the bat. So a design and analysis cycle is you create a design, you do some analysis on it, and then you go back and you change the design. As simple as that. And your first few DACs are going to be shorter because it's going to be more high level. And then as you get further along in the process, it's going to be a lot more detailed and take a lot longer. Early on, you'll want to do trade studies. And these are processes for making big decisions about your design. For example, you could have a make-buy trade study. Are we even needing to design this ourselves? Would it be more expedient to just go to a third party vendor and buy what we need from them? For example, on this drone, I was looking up comparable things that are commercially available. I could spend maybe $2,500 and get pretty much what I'm looking for. Not exactly, but it, it'll be pretty close. So I'm gonna do a make, make buy trade study and I'm pretty sure I'm just gonna be making it because I'm not that rich and uh, the engineering process is the fun part. So buying is less fun than making. Trade studies will allow you to track your reasoning and logically keep track of all aspects of the decision you're trying to make at the same time. Without doing a trade study, we tend to fixate on one metric at a time and unable to see the big picture. This is done by identifying figures of merit which may be quantitative or qualitative. If it's a numerical performance metric, you can set it up as a fixed figure of merit with a range of scores. If it's more qualitative, you're going to have to make it a voted figure of merit voted on by stakeholders in the design. And if you're a one-man show, you just get to assign the number unilaterally. After all the voting is done and the performance buckets are decided, 
you decide how heavily you want to weight each figure of merit. And you should do this without looking at the results, because subconsciously you may be wanting to favor one outcome or another and creating the weight so that it will yield that outcome. But no, if we want this to be completely unbiased and take all the prejudice and impulse out of the process, then do it blindly, just focusing on the weights themselves, not the outcomes. And then once you've done your weights, click over to see the results and see what you just decided, and then throw it all out and just go with what your gut told you anyway. Or if you feel like everything is too close, you might want to play with those weights some more and see if you can get more of a spread. And also don't have the, the scores be one, two, or three. Have them be one, four, and seven. And that helps spread it out some more. You can do trade studies for all kinds of non-engineering decisions too. In fact, this trade study we've been looking at for an example was one my wife and I did to decide what church we were gonna go to after we moved. So you can really nerd out on this stuff. There are many levels of design reviews you'll have to get through. And I'm going to focus on four kind of major ones because that's probably all you're going to care about at, at a small scale. There's technically lots of sub categories of these reviews, but the main ones are concept design review. That's the overall big picture, the idea you had, and some first steps uh, to the design. You've got some pretty CAD images that you made up. It's mostly just volumes and masses and stuff. It's not detail, detailed anything. And the concept design review is just to get you to answer the question, is this possible? Then there's preliminary design review. You've actually fleshed things out a little bit more. You've took, taken a look at some numbers that will start to give you an idea of the potential performance and costs involved. And the preliminary design review, it doesn't have any drawings yet, but you've maybe got some more refined CAD and you've maybe done a couple of des design analysis cycles to narrow it down into one or two options that you're looking at. And the PDR is supposed to just answer the question, is this practical? Are we wasting our efforts <laughs> looking at this? The next level of design review is the critical design review. And this kind of has two levels within it. There's the layout design and the detailed design. The layout design is you've pretty much defined everything in CAD. You've done all the analysis to, to figure out if it has the strength and performance required. Next would be detailed design where you've done all the drawings and had drawing checkers check them, make sure they're ready to be manufactured. They're all very well refined and work you're proud of. There may be some subscale test articles that you build in the process of getting to CDR. And so there may be other types of reviews such as test readiness reviews, other tabletop reviews, you know, test plans and procedures, reviewing all of those things. But the next big category I wanna highlight is the flight readiness review. And that is you have built hardware and you're ready to start a flight test campaign. So you're gonna be looking at airworthiness. Is this actually ready? And you're answering the question, are we sure about this? And there are multiple DAC cycles in each of these stages. It just depends on how complex your project is. I also wanna talk about risk assessment and mitigation. This is a big part of the engineering process that is very important when dealing with anything risky, which when you're pushing the envelope of things like aerospace and all of that, there is definitely risk involved. And it might not all be safety related. You know, I'm, I'm kind of concerned about losing this $800 thermal if I start flying around on a aircraft, you know, it's kind of represents a significant investment for the channel and uh, don't want to lose it. And the there could be safety related things too, even at this small scale. In fact, I remember when I was a kid, I launched a rocket that was not well designed. It had fins on the nose cone and uh, it was unstable. And when I launched it, it almost beamed my sister and she had to duck down. <laughs> so mitigation strategies, maybe don't put 
bins on the nose cone and maybe make sure everyone is aware and get ready to get out of the way if things go sideways, literally. But through those mitigation strategies, you can then lower your risk posture on that risk matrix there. So whereas you might have had some items that are in the orange or the red, now with some key steps taken, you can lower it down to a yellow, perhaps. So why am I making this video at all? Well, this is one of the long-term goals I've had for this channel. It is called Civil Defense Engineer, after all. And I wanted to build civil defenses and militia gear and stuff like that that will really help citizens in a 21st century conflict scenario. The problem is I want to see the Second Amendment applied to more than just pew-pews, you know, because let's face it, Guns aren't the most relevant thing in modern warfare. I know that might be a controversial statement, but what about electronic warfare? What about jamming? Ironically enough, that's more heavily regulated than firearms in this country. You can't build a jamming device, not even for testing, you know, <laughs> not even in a controlled environment, let alone whether it's causing harmful interference. So. But, you know, I still want to cover those things. Uh, I'm not going to, you know, break the law on this channel, of course, but I'm going to be delving into the engineering side of the Second Amendment, citizen preparedness, and just take it 10 steps further than you've got your rifle and your pistol on the flat range. So if that sounds interesting to you, subscribe to the channel and uh, I'll go over the process of different engineering projects in great detail. And uh, it ain't cheap, so if, if it tickles your fancy, consider supporting me on Patreon. The link is down in the description. And uh, I really appreciate it. Until next time, this is Charlie Delta Echo, out.